Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of The Last Apprentice, The Revenge of the Witch by Joseph Delaney, narrated by Christopher Evan Welch. Chapter One, A Seventh Son. When the spook arrived, the light was already beginning to fail. It had been a long, hard day, and I was ready for my supper. You're sure he's a seventh son? he asked. He was looking down at me and shaking his head doubtfully. Dad nodded. And you were a seventh son too? Dad nodded again and started stamping his feet impatiently, splattering my breeches with droplets of brown mud and manure. The rain was dripping from the peak of his cap. It had been raining for most of the month. There were new leaves on the trees, but the spring weather was a long time coming. My dad was a farmer and his father had been a farmer too, and the first rule of farming is to keep the farm together. You can't just divide it up among your children. It would get smaller and smaller with each generation until there was nothing left. So a father leaves his farm to his eldest son. Then he finds jobs for the rest. If possible, he tries to find each a trade. He needs lots of favors for that. The local blacksmith is one option, especially if the farm is big and he's given the blacksmith plenty of work. Then it's odds on that the blacksmith will offer an apprenticeship, but that's still only one son sorted out. I was his seventh, and by the time it came to me, all the favors had been used up. Dad was so desperate that he was trying to get the spook to take me on as his apprentice, or at least that's what I thought at the time. I should have guessed that Ma'am was behind it. She was behind a lot of things. Long before I was born, it was her money that had bought our farm. How else could a seventh son have afforded it? And Ma'am wasn't county. She came from a land far across the sea. Most people couldn't tell, but sometimes, if you listened very carefully, there was a slight difference in the way she pronounced certain words. Still, don't imagine that I was being sold into slavery or something. I was bored with farming anyway, and what they called the town was hardly more than a village in the back of beyond. It was certainly no place that I wanted to spend the rest of my life. So in one way, I quite liked the idea of being a spook. It was much more interesting than milking cows and spreading manure. It made me nervous, though, because it was a scary job. I was going to learn how to protect farms and villages from things that go bump in the night. Dealing with ghouls, boggarts, and all manner of wicked beasties would be all in a day's work. That's what the spook did, and I was going to be his apprentice. How old is he? asked the spook. He'll be thirteen come August. Bit small for his age. Can he read and write? Aye, Dad answered. He can do both, and he also knows Greek. His ma'am taught him, and he could speak it almost before he could walk. The spook nodded and looked back across the muddy path beyond the gate toward the farmhouse, as if he were listening for something. Then he shrugged. It's a hard enough life for a man. Never mind a boy, he said. Think he's up to it? He's strong, and he'll be as big as me when he's full grown, my dad said straightening his back and drawing himself up to his full height. That done, the top of his head was just about level with the spook's chin. Suddenly, the spook smiled. It was the very last thing I'd expected. His face was big and looked as if it had been chiseled from stone. Until then, I'd thought him a bit fierce. His long black cloak and hood made him look like a priest, but when he looked at you directly, his grim expression made him appear more like a hangman weighing you up for the rope. The hair sticking out from under the front of his hood matched his beard, which was gray, but his eyebrows were black and very bushy. There was quite a bit of black hair sprouting out of his nostrils, too, and his eyes were green, the same color as my own. Then I noticed something else about him. He was carrying a long staff. Of course, I'd seen that as soon as he came within sight, but what I hadn't realized until that moment was that he was carrying it in his left hand. Did that mean that he was left-handed, like me? It was something that had caused me no end of trouble at the village school. They'd even called in the local priest to look at me, and he'd kept shaking his head and telling me I'd have to fight it before it was too late. I didn't know what he meant. None of my brothers were left-handed, and neither was my dad. My ma'am was cack-handed, though, and it never seemed to bother her much. So when the teacher threatened to beat it out of me and tied the pen to my right hand, she took me away from the school, and from that day on taught me at home. How much to take him on, my dad asked, interrupting my thoughts. Now we were getting down to the real business. 
Two guineas for a month's trial. If he's up to it, I'll be back again in the autumn and you'll owe me another ten. If not, you can have him back and it'll be just another guinea for my trouble. Dad nodded again and the deal was done. We went into the barn and the guineas were paid, but they didn't shake hands. Nobody wanted to touch a spook. My dad was a brave man just to stand within six feet of one. I've some business close by, said the spook, but I'll be back for the lad at first light. Make sure he's ready. I don't like to be kept waiting. When he'd gone, Dad tapped me on the shoulder. It's a new life for you now, son, he told me. Go and get yourself cleaned up. You're finished with farming. When I walked into the kitchen, my brother Jack had his arm around his wife Ellie, and she was smiling up at him. I like Ellie a lot. She's warm and friendly in a way that makes you feel that she really cares about you. Mam says that marrying Ellie was good for Jack because she helped to make him less agitated. Jack is the eldest and biggest of us all, and, as Dad sometimes jokes, the best looking of an ugly bunch. He is big and strong, all right, but despite his blue eyes and healthy red cheeks, his black bushy eyebrows almost meet in the middle, so I've never agreed with that. One thing I've never argued with is that he managed to attract a kind and pretty wife. Ellie has hair the color of best quality straw three days after a good harvest and skin that really glows in candlelight. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, I blurted out. The spook's coming for me at first light. Ellie's face lit up. You mean he's agreed to take you on? I nodded. He's given me a month's trial. Oh, well done, Tom. I'm really pleased for you, she said. Oh, don't believe it, scoffed Jack. You, apprentice to a spook. How can you do a job like that when you still can't sleep without a candle? I laughed at his joke, but he had a point. I sometimes saw things in the dark, and a candle was the best way to keep them away so that I could get some sleep. Jack came toward me and with a roar got me in a headlock and began dragging me around the kitchen table. It was his idea of a joke. I put up just enough resistance to humor him, and after a few seconds he let go of me and patted me on the back. <laughs> well done, Tom, he said. You'll make a fortune doing that job. There's just one problem, though. What's that? I asked. You'll need every penny you earn. Know why? I shrugged. Because the only friends you'll have are the ones you buy. I tried to smile, but there was a lot of truth in Jack's words. A spook worked and lived alone. Oh, Jack, don't be cruel, Ellie scolded. It was only a joke, Jack replied, as if he couldn't understand why Ellie was making so much fuss. But Ellie was looking at me rather than Jack, and I saw her face suddenly drop. Oh, Tom, she said. This means that you won't be here when the baby's born. She looked really disappointed, and it made me feel sad that I wouldn't be at home to see my new niece. Mam had said that Ellie's baby was going to be a girl, and she was never wrong about things like that. I'll come back and visit just as soon as I can, I promised. Ellie tried to smile, and Jack came up and rested his arm across my shoulders. You'll always have your family, he said. We'll always be here if you need us. An hour later, I sat down to supper, knowing that I'd be gone in the morning. Dad said grace, as he did every evening, and we all muttered amen, except ma'am. She just stared down at her food as usual, waiting politely until it was over. As the prayer ended, ma'am gave me a little smile. It was a warm, special smile, and I don't think anyone else noticed. It made me feel better. The fire was still burning in the grate, filling the kitchen with warmth. At the center of our large wooden table was a brass candlestick, which had been polished until you could see your face in it. The candle was made of beeswax and was expensive, but Mam wouldn't allow tallow in the kitchen because of the smell. Dad made most of the decisions on the farm, but in some things, she always got her own way. As we tucked into our big plates of steaming hot pot, it struck me how old Dad looked tonight. Old and tired and there was an expression that flickered across his face from time to time, a hint of sadness. But he brightened up a bit when he and Jack started discussing the price of pork and whether or not it was the right time to send for the pig butcher. Better to wait another month or so, Dad said. The price is sure to go higher. Jack shook his head, and they began to argue. It was a friendly argument, the kind families often have, and I could tell that Dad was enjoying it. I didn't join in, though. All that was over for me, as Dad had told me. I was finished with farming. Mam and Ellie were chuckling together softly. I tried to catch what they were saying, but by now Jack was in full flow, his voice getting louder and louder. 
When Ma'am glanced across at him, I could tell she'd had enough of his noise. Oblivious to Ma'am's glances and continuing to argue loudly, Jack reached across for the salt cellar and accidentally knocked it over, spilling a small cone of salt on the tabletop. Straight away he took a pinch and threw it back over his left shoulder. It is an old county superstition. By doing that, you were supposed to ward off the bad luck you'd earned by spilling it. Jack, you don't need any salt on that anyway, Ma'am scolded. It spoils a good hot pot and is an insult to the cook. Sorry, Ma'am, Jack apologized. You're right. It's perfect just as it is. She gave him a smile, then nodded toward me. Anyway, no one's taking any notice of Tom. That's no way to treat him on his last night at home. I'm all right, ma'am, I told her. I'm happy just to sit here and listen. Ma'am nodded. Well, now I've got a few things to say to you. After supper, stay down in the kitchen, and we'll have a little talk. So, after Jack, Ellie, and Dad had gone up to bed, I sat in a chair by the fire and waited patiently to hear what Ma'am had to say. Ma'am wasn't a woman who made a lot of fuss. At first, she didn't say much, apart from explaining what she was wrapping up for me. A spare pair of trousers, three shirts, and two pairs of good socks that had only been darned once each. I stared into the embers of the fire, tapping my feet on the flags while Ma'am drew up her rocking chair and positioned it so that she was facing directly toward me. Her black hair was streaked with a few strands of grey, but apart from that she looked much the same as she had when I was just a toddler, hardly up to her knees. Her eyes were still bright, and but for her pale skin, she looked a picture of health. This is the last time we'll get to talk together for some time, she said. It's a big step, leaving home and starting out on your own. So if there's anything you need to say, anything you need to ask, now's the time to do it. I couldn't think of a single question. In fact, I couldn't even think. Hearing her say all that had started tears pricking behind my eyes. The silence went on for quite a while. All that could be heard was my feet tap-tapping on the flags. Finally, Ma'am gave a little sigh. What's wrong? she asked. Has the cat got your tongue? I shrugged. Stop fidgeting, Tom, and concentrate on what I'm saying, Ma'am warned. First of all, are you looking forward to tomorrow, and starting your new job? I'm not sure, Ma'am. I told her, remembering Jack's joke about having to buy friends. Nobody wants to go anywhere near a spook. I'll have no friends. I'll be lonely all the time. It won't be as bad as you think, Ma'am said. You'll have your master to talk to. He'll be your teacher, and no doubt he'll eventually become your friend. And you'll be busy all the time, busy learning new things. You'll have no time to feel lonely. Don't you find the whole thing new and exciting? It's exciting, but the job scares me. I want to do it, but I don't know if I can. One part of me wants to travel and see places, but it'll be hard not to live here anymore. I'll miss you all. I'll miss being at home. You can't stay here, Ma'am said. Your dad's getting too old to work, and come next winter he's handing the farm over to Jack. Ellie will be having her baby soon, no doubt the first of many. Eventually there won't be room for you here. No, you'd better get used to it before that happens. You can't come home. Her voice seemed cold and a little sharp, and to hear her speak to me like that drove a pain deep into my chest and throat so that I could hardly breathe. I just wanted to go to bed then, but she had a lot to say. I rarely heard her use so many words all in one go. You have a job to do, and you're going to do it, she said sternly. And not only do it, you're going to do it well. I married your dad because he was a seventh son, and I bore him six sons so that I could have you. Seven times seven you are, and you have the gift. Your new master's still strong, but he's some way past his best, and his time is finally coming to an end. For nearly sixty years he's walked the county lines doing his duty, doing what has to be done. Soon it'll be your turn, and if you won't do it, then who will? Who'll look after the ordinary folk? Who'll keep them from harm? Who'll make the farms, villages, and towns safe? so that women and children can walk the streets and lanes free from fear. I didn't know what to say, and I couldn't look her in the eye. I just fought to hold back the tears. I love everyone in this house, she said, her voice softening. But in the whole wide county, you're the only person who's really like me. As yet, you're just a boy who's still got a lot of growing to do, but you're the seventh son of a seventh son. You've the gift and the strength to do what has to be done. I know you're going to make me proud of you. Well now, 
ma'am said, coming to her feet. I'm glad we've got that sorted out. Now off to bed with you. It's a big day tomorrow, and you want to be at your best. She gave me a hug and a warm smile, and I tried really hard to be cheerful and smile back. But once up in my bedroom, I sat on the edge of my bed, just staring vacantly and thinking about what ma'am had told me. My ma'am is well respected in the neighborhood. She knows more about plants and medicines than the local doctor. And when there is a problem with delivering a baby, the midwife always sends for her. Ma'am is an expert on what she calls breech births. Sometimes a baby tries to get born feet first, but my mother is good at turning them while they are still in the womb. Dozens of women in the county owe their lives to her. Anyway, that was what my dad always said. But ma'am was modest, and she never mentioned things like that. She just got on with what had to be done, and I knew that's what she expected of me. So I wanted to make her proud. But could she really mean that she'd only married my dad and had my six brothers so she could give birth to me? Didn't seem possible. After thinking things through, I went across to the window and sat in the old wicker chair for a few minutes, staring through the window, which faced north. The moon was shining, bathing everything in its silver light. I could see across the farmyard, beyond the two hayfields and the north pasture, right to the boundary of our farm, which ended halfway up Hangman's Hill. I liked the view. I liked Hangman's Hill, from a distance. I liked the way it was the farthest thing you could see. For years this had been my routine before climbing into bed each night. I used to stare at that hill and imagine what was on the other side. I knew that it was really just more fields and then, two miles farther on, what passed for the local village. Half a dozen houses, a small church, and an even smaller school. But my imagination conjured up other things. Sometimes I imagined high cliffs with an ocean beyond, or maybe a forest, or a great city with tall towers and twinkling lights. But now, as I gazed at the hill, I remembered my fear as well. Yes, it was fine from a distance, but it wasn't a place I'd ever wanted to get close to. Hangman's Hill, as you might have guessed, didn't get its name for nothing. Three generations earlier, a war had raged over the whole land, and the men of the county had played their part. It had been that worst of all wars, a bitter civil war where families had been divided and where sometimes brother had even fought brother. In the last winter of the war, there had been a big battle a mile or so to the north, just on the outskirts of the village. When it was finally over, the winning army had brought their prisoners to this hill and hanged them from the trees on its northern slope. They'd hanged some of their own men, too, for what they claimed was cowardice in the face of the enemy. There was another version of that tale. It was said that some of these men had refused to fight people they considered to be neighbors. Even Jack never liked working close to that boundary fence, and the dogs wouldn't go more than a few feet into the wood. As for me, because I can sense things that others can't, I couldn't even work in the north pasture. You see, from there, I could hear them. I could hear the ropes creaking and the branches groaning under their weight. I could hear the dead strangling and choking on the other side of the hill. Ma'am had said that we were like each other. Well, she was certainly like me in one way. I knew she could also see things that others couldn't. One winter, when I was very young and all my brothers lived at home, the noises from the hill got so bad at night that I could even hear them from my bedroom. My brothers didn't hear a thing, but I did, and I couldn't sleep. Ma'am came to my room every time I called, even though she had to be up at the crack of dawn to do her chores. Finally, she said she was going to sort it out, and one night she climbed Hangman's Hill alone and went up into the trees. When she came back, everything was quiet, and it stayed like that for months afterward. So there was one way in which we weren't alike. Ma'am was a lot braver than I was. Chapter 2 On the Road I was up an hour before dawn, but Ma'am was already in the kitchen cooking my favorite breakfast, bacon and eggs. Dad came downstairs while I was mopping the plate with my last slice of bread. As we said goodbye, he pulled something from his pocket and placed it in my hands. It was the small tinder box that had belonged to his own dad and to his granddad before that, one of his favorite possessions. I want you to have this, son, he said. It might come in useful in your new job. And come back and see us soon, just because you've left home. It doesn't mean that you can't come back and visit. It's time to go, son, ma'am said, walking across to give me a final hug. He's at the gate. Don't keep him waiting. We were a family that didn't like too much fuss, and as we'd already said our goodbyes, I walked out into the yard alone. 
The spook was on the other side of the gate, a dark silhouette against the gray dawn light. His hood was up, and he was standing straight and tall, his staff in his left hand. I walked toward him, carrying my small bundle of possessions, feeling very nervous. To my surprise, the spook opened the gate and came into the yard. Well, lad, he said, follow me. We might as well start the way we mean to go on. Instead of heading for the road, he led the way north, directly toward Hangman's Hill, and soon we were crossing the north pasture, my heart already starting to thump. When we reached the boundary fence, the spook climbed over with the ease of a man half his age, but I froze. As I rested my hands against the top edge of the fence, I could already hear the sounds of the trees creaking, their branches bent and bowed under the weight of the hanging men. What's the matter, lad? asked the spook, turning to look back at me. If you're frightened of something on your own doorstep, you'll be of little use to me. I took a deep breath and clambered over the fence. We trudged upward, the dawn light darkening as we moved up into the gloom of the trees. The higher we climbed, the colder it seemed to get, and soon I was shivering. It was the kind of cold that gives you goose pimples and makes the hair on the back of your neck start to rise. It was a warning that something wasn't quite right. I had felt it before when something had come close that didn't belong in this world. Once we'd reached the summit of the hill, I could see them below me. There had to be a hundred at least, sometimes two or three hanging from the same tree, wearing soldiers' uniforms with broad leather belts and big boots. Their hands were tied behind their backs, and all of them behaved differently. Some struggled desperately so that the branch above them bounced and jerked, while others were just spinning slowly on the end of the rope, pointing first one way, then the other. As I watched, I suddenly felt a strong wind on my face, a wind so cold and fierce that it couldn't have been natural. The trees bowed low, and their leaves shriveled and began to fall. Within moments, all the branches were bare. When the wind had eased, the spook put his hand on my shoulder and guided me nearer to the hanging men. We stopped just feet away from the nearest. Look at him, said the spook. What do you see? A dead soldier, I replied, my voice beginning to wobble. How old does he look? Seventeen, at the most. Good. Well done, lad. Now tell me, do you still feel scared? A bit. I don't like being so close to him. Why, there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing that can hurt you. Think about what it must have been like for him. Concentrate on him rather than yourself. How must he have felt? What would be the worst thing? I tried to put myself in the soldier's place and imagine how it must have been to die like that. The pain and the struggle for breath would have been terrible, but there might have been something even worse. He'd have known he was dying and that he'd never be able to go home again, that he'd never see his family again, I told the spook. With those words, a wave of sadness washed over me. Then, even as that happened, the hanging men slowly began to disappear until we were alone on the hillside and the leaves were back on the trees. How do you feel now? Still afraid? I shook my head. No, I said. I just feel sad. Well done, lad. You're learning. We're the seventh sons of seventh sons, and we have the gift of seeing things that others can't. But that gift can sometimes be a curse. If we're afraid, sometimes there are things that can feed on that fear. Fear makes it worse for us. The trick is to concentrate on what you can see and stop thinking about yourself. It works every time. It was a terrible sight, lad, but they're just ghasts, continued the spook. There's nothing much we can do about them, and they'll just fade away in their own time. In a hundred years or so, there'll be nothing left. I felt like telling him that Mam did something about them once, but I didn't. To contradict him would have gotten us off to a bad start. Now, if they were ghosts, that would be different, said the spook. You can talk to ghosts and tell them what's what. Just making them realize they're dead is a great kindness and an important step in getting them to move on. Usually a ghost is a bewildered spirit trapped on this earth but not knowing what's happened. So often they're in torment. Then again, others are here with a definite purpose, and they might have things to tell you. But a ghast is just a fragment of a soul that's gone on to better things. That's what these are, lad. Just ghasts. You saw the trees change. The leaves fell, and it was winter. 
Well, the leaves are back now, so you were just looking at something from the past. Just a reminder of the evil things that sometimes happen on this earth. Usually, if you're brave, they can't see you and they don't feel anything. A ghast is just like a reflection in a pond that stays behind when its owner has moved on. Understand what I'm saying? I nodded. Right, so that's one thing sorted out. We will be dealing with the dead from time to time, so you might as well get used to them. Anyway, let's get started. We've quite a way to go. Here, yeah, from now on, you'll be carrying this. The spook handed me his big leather bag and, without a backward glance, headed back up the hill. I followed him over its crest, then down through the trees toward the road, which was a distant gray scar meandering its way south through the green and brown patchwork of fields. Done much traveling, lad? The spook called back over his shoulder. Seen much of the county? I told him I'd never been more than six miles from my dad's farm. Going to the local market was the most traveling I'd ever done. The spook muttered something under his breath and shook his head. I could tell that he wasn't best pleased by my answer. Well, your travels start today, he said. We're heading south toward a village called Horshaw. It's just over fifteen miles as the crow flies, and we have to be there before dark. I'd heard of Horshaw. It was a pit village and had the largest coal yards in the county, holding the output of dozens of surrounding mines. I'd never expected to go there, and I wondered what the spook's business could be in a place like that. He walked at a furious pace, taking big, effortless strides. Soon I was struggling to keep up, as well as carrying my own small bundle of clothes and other belongings. I now had his bag, which seemed to be getting heavier by the minute. Then, just to make things worse, it started to rain. About an hour before noon, the spook came to a sudden halt. He turned round and stared hard at me. By then I was about ten paces behind. My feet were hurting and I'd already developed a slight limp. The road was little more than a track that was quickly turning to mud. Just as I caught up with him, I stubbed my toe, slip, and almost lost my balance. He tutted. Feeling dizzy, lad? he asked. I shook my head. I wanted to give my arm a rest, but it didn't seem right to put his bag down in the mud. That's good, said the spook with a faint smile, the rain dripping from the edge of his hood down onto his beard. Never trust a man who's dizzy. That's something well worth remembering. I'm not dizzy, I protested. No, said the spook, raising his bushy eyebrows. And it must be your boots. They won't be much use in this job. My boots were the same as my dad's and Jack's, sturdy enough and suitable for the mud and muck of the farmyard, but the kind that needed a lot of getting used to. A new pair usually cost you a fortnight's blisters before your feet got bedded in. I looked down at the spooks. They were made of strong, good-quality leather, and they had extra thick soles. They must have cost a fortune, but I suppose that for someone who did a lot of walking, they were worth every penny. They flexed as he walked, and I just knew that they'd been comfortable from the very first moment he pulled them on. Good boots are important in this job, said the spook. We depend on neither man nor beast to get us where we need to go. If you rely on your own two good legs, then they won't let you down. So if I finally decide to take you on, I'll get you a pair of boots just like mine. Until then... You'll just have to manage as best you can. At noon, we halted for a short break, sheltering from the rain in an abandoned cattle shed. The spook took a piece of cloth out of his pocket and unwrapped it, revealing a large lump of yellow cheese. He broke off a bit and handed it to me. I'd seen worse, and I was hungry, so I wolfed it down. The spook only ate a small piece himself before wrapping the rest up again and stuffing it back into his pocket. Once out of the rain, he'd pulled his hood back, so I now had the chance to look at him properly for the first time. Apart from the full beard and the hangman's eyes, his most noticeable feature was his nose, which was grim and sharp, with a curve to it that suggested a bird's beak. The mouth, when closed, was almost hidden by that mustache and beard. The beard itself had looked gray at first glance, but when I looked closer, trying to be as casual as possible so that he wouldn't notice, I saw that most of the colors of the rainbow seemed to be sprouting there. There were shades of red, black, brown, and obviously lots of gray. But as I came to realize later, it all depended on the light. Weak jaw, weak character, my dad always used to say, and he also believed that some men wore beards just to hide that fact. Looking at the spook, though, you could see, despite the beard, that his jaw was long, and when he opened his mouth, he revealed yellow teeth that were very sharp and more suited to gnawing on red meat than nibbling at cheese. With a shiver, I suddenly realized that he reminded me of a wolf, and it wasn't just the way he looked. 
He was a kind of predator because he haunted the dark. Living merely on nibbles of cheese would make him always hungry and mean. If I completed my apprenticeship, I'd end up just like him. You still hungry, lad? He asked, his green eyes boring hard into my own until I started to feel a bit dizzy. I was soaked to the skin, and my feet were hurting, but most of all I was hungry. So I nodded, thinking he might offer me some more, but he just shook his head and muttered something to himself. Then once again, he looked at me sharply. Hunger's something you're going to have to get used to, he said. We don't eat much when we're working, and if the job's very difficult, we don't eat anything at all until afterward. Fasting's the safest thing because it makes us less vulnerable to the dark. It makes us stronger. So you might as well start practicing now, because when we get to Horshaw, I'm going to give you a little test. You're going to spend a night in a haunted house, and you're going to do it alone. That'll show me what you're really made of. Chapter 3 Number 13, Watery Lane we reached Horshaw as a church bell began to chime in the distance. It was seven o'clock and starting to get dark. A heavy drizzle blew straight into our faces, but there was still enough light for me to judge that this wasn't a place I ever wanted to live in and that even a short visit would be best avoided. Horshaw was a black smear against the green fields, a grim, ugly little place with about two dozen rows of mean back-to-back -back houses huddling together mainly on the southern slope of a damp, bleak hillside. The whole area was riddled with mines, and Horshaw was at its center. High above the village was a large slag heap, which marked the entrance to a mine. Behind the slag heap were the coal yards, which stored enough fuel to keep the biggest towns in the county warm through even the longest of winters. Soon we were walking down through the narrow cobbled streets, keeping pressed close to the grimy walls to make way for carts heaped with black lumps of coal, wet and gleaming with rain. The huge shire horses that pulled them were straining against their loads, hooves slipping on the shiny cobbles. There were few people about, but lace curtains twitched as we passed, and once we met a group of dour-faced miners who were trudging up the hill to begin their night shift. They'd been talking in loud voices, but suddenly fell silent and moved into a single column to pass us, keeping to the far side of the street. One of them actually made the sign of the cross. Get used to it, lad, growled the spook. We're needed but rarely welcomed, and some places are worse than others. Finally, we turned a corner into the lowest and meanest street of all. Nobody lived there, you could tell that right away. For one thing, some of the windows were broken and others were boarded up, and although it was almost dark, no lights were showing. At one end of the street was an abandoned corn merchant's warehouse, two huge wooden doors gaping open and hanging from their rusty hinges. The spook halted outside the very last house. It was the one on the corner, closest to the warehouse, the only house in the street to have a number. That number was crafted out of metal and nailed to the door. It was 13, the worst and unluckiest of all numbers, and directly above there was a street sign high on the wall, hanging from a single rusty rivet and pointing almost vertically toward the cobbles. It said, Watery Lane. This house did have window panes, but the lace curtains were yellow and hung with cobwebs. This must be the haunted house my master had warned me about. The spook pulled a key from his pocket, unlocked the door, and led the way into the darkness within. At first, I was just glad to be out of the drizzle, but when he lit a candle and positioned it on the floor near the middle of the small front room, I knew that I'd be more comfortable in an abandoned cowshed. There wasn't a single item of furniture to be seen just a bare flagged floor and a heap of dirty straw under the window. The room was damp, too, the air very dank and cold, and by the light of the flickering candle I could see my breath steaming. What I saw was bad enough, but what he said was even worse. Well, lad, I've got business to attend to, so I'll be off, but I'll be back later. Know what you have to do? No, sir, I replied, watching the flickering candle, worried that it might go out at any second. Well, it's what I told you earlier. Weren't you listening? You need to be alert, not dreaming. Anyway, it's nothing very difficult, he explained, scratching at his beard as if there were something crawling about in it. You just have to spend the night here alone. I bring all my new apprentices to this old house on their first night so I can find out what they're made of. Oh, but there's one thing I haven't told you. At midnight, I'll expect you to go down into the cellar and face whatever it is that's lurking there. 
cope with that, and you're well on your way to being taken on permanently. Any questions? I had questions, all right, but I was too scared to hear the answers, so I just shook my head and tried to keep my top lip from trembling. How will you know when it's midnight? He asked. I shrugged. I was pretty good at guessing the time from the position of the sun or the stars, and if I ever woke in the middle of the night, I almost always knew exactly what time it was, but here I wasn't so sure. In some places, time seems to move more slowly, and I had a feeling that this old house would be one of them. Suddenly I remembered the church clock. It's just gone seven, I said. I'll listen for twelve chimes. Well, at least you're awake now, the spook said with a little smile. When the clock strikes twelve, take the stub of the candle and use it to find your way down to the cellar. Until then, sleep if you can manage it. Now listen carefully. There are three important things to remember. Don't open the front door to anyone, no matter how hard they knock, and don't be late going down to the cellar. He took a step toward the front door. What's the third thing? I called out at the very last moment. The candle, lad. Whatever else you do, don't let it go out. Then he was gone, closing the door behind him, and I was all alone. Cautiously, I picked up the candle, walked to the kitchen door, and peered inside. It was empty of everything but a stone sink. The back door was closed, but the wind still wailed beneath it. There were two other doors on the right. One was open, and I could see the bare wooden stairs that led to the bedrooms above. The other one, that closest to me, was closed. Something about that closed door made me uneasy, but I decided to take a quick look. Nervously, I gripped the handle and tugged at the door. It was hard to shift, and for a moment... I had a creepy feeling that somebody was holding it closed on the other side. When I tugged even harder, it opened with a jerk, making me lose my balance. I staggered back a couple of steps and almost dropped the candle. Stone steps led down into the darkness, and they were black with coal dust. They curved away to the left, so I couldn't see right down into the cellar, but a cold draft came up them, making the candle flame dance and flicker. I closed the door quickly and went back into the front room, closing the kitchen door too. I put the candle down carefully in the corner farthest away from the door and window. Once I was satisfied that it wouldn't fall over, I looked for a place on the floor where I could sleep. There wasn't much choice. I certainly wasn't sleeping on the damp straw, so I settled down in the center of the room. The flags were hard and cold, but I closed my eyes. Once asleep, I'd be away from that grim old house, and I felt pretty confident that I'd wake just before midnight. Usually, I get to sleep easily, but this was different. I kept shivering with cold, and the wind was beginning to rattle the window panes. There were also rustlings and patterings coming from the walls. Just mice, I kept telling myself. We were certainly used to them on the farm. But then, suddenly, there came a disturbing new sound from down below in the depths of the dark cellar. At first it was faint, making me strain my ears, but gradually it grew until I was in no doubt about what I could hear. Down in the cellar, Something was happening that shouldn't be happening. Someone was digging rhythmically, turning heavy earth with a sharp metal spade. First came the grind of the metal edge striking a stony surface, followed by a soft, squelching, sucking sound as the spade pushed deep into heavy clay and tore it free from the earth. This went on for several minutes until the noise stopped as suddenly as it had begun. All was quiet. Even the mice stopped their pattering. It was as if the house and everything in it were holding their breath. I know I was. The silence ended with a resounding thump. Then a whole series of thumps, definite in rhythm, thumps that were getting louder and louder and closer. Someone was climbing the stairs from the cellar. I snatched up the candle and shrank into the farthest corner. Thump, thump, nearer and nearer came the sound of heavy boots, who could have been digging down there in the darkness? Who could be climbing the stairs now? But maybe it wasn't a question of who was climbing the stairs. Maybe it was a question of what. I heard the cellar door open and the thump of boots in the kitchen. I pressed myself back into the corner, trying to make myself small, waiting for the kitchen door to open. And open it did, very slowly, with a loud creak. Something stepped into the room. I felt coldness then, real coldness. 
a kind of coldness that told me something was close that didn't belong on this earth. It was like the coldness of Hangman's Hill, only far, far worse. I lifted the candle, its flame flickering eerie shadows that danced up the walls and onto the ceiling. Who's there? I asked. Who's there? My voice trembled even more than the hand holding the candle. There was no answer. Even the wind outside had fallen silent. Who's there? I called out again. Again no reply, but invisible boots grated on the flags as they stepped toward me. Nearer and nearer they came, and now I could hear breathing. Something big was breathing heavily. It sounded like a huge cart horse that had just pulled a heavy load up a steep hill. At the very last moment, the footsteps veered away from me and halted close to the window. I was holding my breath, and the thing by the window seemed to be breathing for both of us, drawing great gulps of air into its lungs as if it could never get enough. Just when I could stand it no longer, it gave a huge sigh that sounded weary and sad at the same time, and the invisible boots grated on the flags once more, heavy steps that moved away from the window, back toward the door. When they began to thump their way down the cellar steps, I was finally able to breathe again. My heart began to slow, my hands stopped shaking, and gradually I calmed down. I had to pull myself together. I'd been scared, but if that was the worst that was going to happen tonight, I'd gotten through it, passed my first test. I was going to be the spook's apprentice, so I'd have to get used to places like this haunted house. It went with the job. After about five minutes or so, I began to feel better. I even thought about making another attempt to get to sleep. But, as my dad sometimes says, there's no rest for the wicked. Well, I don't know what I'd done wrong, but there was a sudden new sound to disturb me. It was faint and distant at first, something knocking on a door. There was a pause, and then it happened again. Three distinct raps, but a little nearer this time. Another pause, and three more raps. It didn't take me long to work it out. Something was rapping hard on each door in the street, moving nearer and nearer to number 13. When it finally came to the haunted house, the three raps on the front door were loud enough to wake the dead. Would the thing in the cellar climb the steps to answer that summons? I felt trapped between the two. Something outside wanting to get in, something below that wanted to be free. And then suddenly, it was all right. A voice called to me from the other side of the front door, a voice I recognized. Tom, Tom, open the door, let me in. It was ma'am. I was so glad to hear her that I rushed to the front door without thinking. It was raining outside and she'd be getting wet. Quickly, Tom, quickly, ma'am called. Don't keep me waiting. I was actually lifting the latch to open it when I remembered the spook's warning. Don't open the front door to anyone, no matter how hard they knock. But how could I leave ma'am out there in the dark? Come on, Tom, let me in, the voice called again. Remembering what the spook had said, I took a deep breath and tried to think. Common sense told me it couldn't be her. Why would she have followed me all this way? How would she have known where we were going? Ma'am wouldn't have traveled alone either. My dad or Jack would have come with her. No, it was something else waiting outside, something without hands that could still rap on the door, something without feet that could still stand on the pavement. The knocking started to get louder. Please let me in, Tom, pleaded the voice. How can you be so hard and cruel? I'm cold, wet, and tired. Eventually it began to cry, and then I knew for certain that it couldn't possibly be ma'am. Ma'am was strong. Ma'am never cried, no matter how bad things got. After a few moments, the sounds faded and stopped altogether. I lay down on the floor and tried to sleep again. I kept turning over, first one way and then the other, but try as I might, I couldn't get to sleep. The wind began to rattle the window panes even louder, and on every hour and half hour the church clock chimed, moving me closer to midnight. The nearer the time came for me to go down the cellar steps, the more nervous I became. I did want to pass the spook's test, but, oh, how I longed to be back home in my nice, safe, warm bed. And then, just after the clock had given a single chime, half past eleven, the digging began again. Once more I heard the slow thump, thump of heavy boots coming up the steps from the cellar. 
Once more the door opened and the invisible boots stepped into the front room. By now, the only bit of me that was moving was my heart, which pounded so hard it seemed about to break my ribs. But this time, the boots didn't veer away in the direction of the window. They kept coming. Thump, 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 coming straight toward me. I felt myself being lifted roughly by the hair and skin at the nape of my neck, just like a mother cat carries her kittens. Then an invisible arm wrapped itself around my body, pinning my arms to my sides. I tried to suck in a breath, but it was impossible. My chest was being crushed. I was being carried toward the cellar door. I couldn't see what was carrying me, but I could hear its wheezing breath, and I struggled in a panic because somehow I knew exactly what was going to happen. Somehow I knew why there'd been the sound of digging from below. I was going to be carried down the cellar steps into the darkness, and I knew that a grave was waiting for me down there. I was going to be buried alive. I was terrified and tried to cry out, but it was worse than just being held in a tight grip. I was paralyzed and couldn't move a muscle. Suddenly I was falling. I found myself on all fours, staring at the open door to the cellar just inches from the top step. In a panic, my heart thumping too fast to count the beats, I lurched to my feet and slammed the cellar door shut. Still trembling, I went back into the front room to find that one of the spook's three rules had been broken. The candle had gone out. As I walked toward the window, a sudden flash of light illuminated the room, followed by a loud crash of thunder almost directly overhead. Rain squalled against the house, rattling the windows and making the front door creak and groan as if something were trying to get in. I stared out miserably for a few minutes, watching the flashes of lightning. It was a bad night, but even though lightning scared me, I would have given anything to be out there walking the streets, anything to have avoided going down into that cellar. In the distance, the church clock began to chime. I counted the chimes, and there were exactly twelve. Now I had to face what was in the cellar. It was then, as lightning lit the room again, that I noticed the large footprints on the floor. At first I thought they'd been made by the spook, but they were black, as if the huge boots that made them had been covered with coal dust. They came from the direction of the kitchen door, went almost to the window, and then turned and went back the way they'd come, back to the cellar, down into the dark, where I had to go. Forcing myself forward, I searched the floor with my hand for the stub of the candle. Then I scrabbled around for my small bundle of clothes. Wrapped in the center of it was the tinder box that Dad had given me. Fumbling in the dark, I shook the small pile of tinder out onto the floor and used the stone and metal to strike up sparks. I kindled that little pile of wood until it burst into flame, just long enough to light the candle. Little had Dad known that his gift would prove so useful so soon. As I opened the cellar door, there was another flash of lightning and a sudden crash of thunder that shook the whole house and rumbled down the steps ahead of me. I descended into the cellar my hand trembling in the candle stub, dancing till strange shadows flickered against the wall. I didn't want to go down there, but if I failed the spook's test, I'd probably be on my way back home as soon as it came light. I imagined my shame at having to tell Mam what had happened. Eight steps, and I was turning the corner so that the cellar was in view. It wasn't a big cellar, but it had dark shadows in the corners that the candlelight couldn't quite reach and there were spiders' webs hanging from the ceiling in frail, mucky curtains. Small pieces of coal and large wooden crates were scattered against the earthen floor, and there was an old wooden table next to a big beer barrel. I stepped around the beer barrel and noticed something in the far corner, something just behind some crates that scared me so much I almost dropped the candle. It was a dark shape, almost like a bundle of rags, and it was making a noise, a faint rhythmical sound, like breathing. I took a step toward the rags, then another, using all my willpower to make my legs move. It was then, as I got so close that I could have touched it, that the thing suddenly grew. From a shadow on the floor, it reared up before me until it was three or four times bigger. I almost ran. It was tall, dark, hooded, and terrifying, with green, glittering eyes. Only then did I notice the staff that it was holding in its left hand. What kept you? demanded the spook. 
You're nearly five minutes late. Chapter 4 The Letter I lived in this house as a child, said the spook, and I saw things that would make your big toes curl, but I was the only one who could, and my dad used to beat me for telling lies. Something used to climb up out of the cellar. It would have been the same for you. Am I right? I nodded. Well, it's nothing to worry about, lad. It's just another ghast. A fragment of a troubled soul that's gone on to better things. Without leaving the bad part of himself behind, he'd have been stuck here forever. What did he do? I asked, my voice echoing back slightly from the ceiling. The spook shook his head sadly. He was a miner whose lungs were so diseased that he couldn't work any more. He spent his days and nights coughing and struggling for breath, and his poor wife kept them both. She worked in a bakery, but sadly for both of them, she was a very pretty woman, and some pretty women can't be trusted. To make it worse, he was a jealous man, and his illness made him bitter. One evening she was very late home from work, and he kept going to the window, pacing backward and forward getting more and more angry because he thought she was with another man. When she finally came in, he was in such a rage that he broke her head open with a big lump of coal. Then he left her there, dying on the flags, and went down into the cellar to dig a grave. She was still alive when he came back, but she couldn't move and couldn't even cry out. That's the terror that comes to us, because it's how she felt as he picked her up and carried her down into the darkness of the cellar. She'd heard him digging. She knew what he was going to do. Later that night, he killed himself. It's a sad story, but although they're at peace now, his ghast's still here, and so are her final memories, both strong enough to torment folks like us. We see things that others can't, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's a very useful thing in our trade, though. I shuddered. I felt sorry for the poor wife who'd been murdered, and I felt sorry for the miner who'd killed her. I even felt sorry for the spook. Imagine having to spend your childhood in a house like this. I looked down at the candle, which I'd placed in the middle of the table. It was almost burned down, and the flame was starting its last flickering dance. But the spook didn't show any sign of wanting to go back upstairs. I didn't like the shadows on his face. It looked as if it were gradually changing, as if he were growing a snout or something. Do you know how I overcame my fear? he asked. No, sir. One night I was so terrified that I screamed out before I could stop myself. I woke everybody up, and in a rage my father lifted me up by the scruff of my neck and carried me down the steps into this cellar. Then he got a hammer and nailed the door shut behind me. I wasn't very old, probably seven at the most, I climbed back up the steps and, screaming fit to burst, scratched and banged at the door. But my father was a hard man, and he left me all alone in the dark, and I had to stay there for hours until long after dawn. After a bit, I calmed down. And do you know what I did then? I shook my head, trying not to look at his face. His eyes were glittering very brightly, and he looked more like a wolf than ever. I walked down the steps and sat there in this cellar in the darkness. Then I took three deep breaths, and I faced my fear. I faced the darkness itself, which is the most terrifying thing of all, especially for people like us, because things come to us in the dark. They seek us out with whispers and take shapes that only our eyes can see. But I did it, and when I left this cellar, the worst was over. At that moment, the candle guttered and then went out, plunging us into absolute darkness. This is it, lad, the spook said. There's just you, me, and the dark. Can you stand it? Are you fit to be my apprentice? His voice sounded different, sort of deeper and strange. I imagined him on all fours by now, wolf hair covering his face, his teeth growing longer. I was trembling and couldn't speak until I'd taken my third deep breath. Only then did I give him my answer. It was something my dad always said when he had to do something unpleasant or difficult. Someone has to do it, I said. 
so it might as well be me. The spook must have thought that was funny, because his laughter filled the whole cellar before rumbling up the steps to meet the next peal of thunder, which was on its way down. Nearly thirteen years ago, said the spook, a sealed letter was sent to me. It was short and to the point, and it was written in Greek. Your mother sent it. Do you know what it said? No, I said quietly, wondering what was coming next. I've just given birth to a baby boy, she wrote, and he's the seventh son of a seventh son. His name is Thomas J. Ward, and he's my gift to the county. When he's old enough, we'll send you word. Train him well. He'll be the best apprentice you've ever had, and he'll also be your last. We don't use magic, lad, the spook said, his voice hardly more than a whisper in the darkness. The main tools of our trade are common sense, courage, and the keeping of accurate records so we can learn from the past. Above all, we don't believe in prophecy. We don't believe that the future is fixed. So if what your mother wrote comes true, then it's because we make it come true. Do you understand? There was an edge of anger in his voice, but I knew it wasn't directed at me, so I just nodded into the darkness. As for being your mother's gift to the county, every single one of my apprentices was the seventh son of a seventh son, so don't you start thinking you're anything special. You've a lot of study and hard work ahead of you. Family can be a nuisance, the spook went on after a pause, his voice softer, the anger gone. I've only got two brothers left now. One's a locksmith, and we get on all right, but the other one hasn't spoken to me for well over forty years, though he still lives here in Horshaw. By the time we left the house, the storm had blown itself out and the moon was visible. As the spook closed the front door, I noticed for the first time what had been carved there in the wood. The spook nodded toward it. I use signs like this to warn others who've the skill to read them, or sometimes just to jog my own memory. You'll recognize the Greek letter gamma. It's the sign for either a ghost or a ghast. The cross on the lower right is the Roman numeral for ten, which is the lowest grading of all. Anything above six is just a ghast. There's nothing in that house that can harm you, not if you're brave. Remember, the dark feeds on fear. Be brave, and there's nothing much a ghast can do. If I'd only known that to begin with. Buck up, lad, said the spook. Your face is nearly down in your boots. Well, maybe this will cheer you up. He pulled the lump of yellow cheese out of his pocket, broke off a small piece, and handed it to me. Chew on this, he said, but don't swallow it all at once. I followed him down the cobbled street. The air was damp, but at least it wasn't raining and to the west the clouds looked like lamb's wool against the sky and were starting to tear and break up into ragged strips. We left the village and continued south, right on its edge, where the cobbled street became a muddy lane. There was a small church. It looked neglected. There were slates missing off the roof and paint peeling from the main door. We'd hardly seen anyone since leaving the house, but there was an old man standing in the doorway. His hair was white and it was lank, greasy and unkempt. His dark clothes marked him out as a priest, but as we approached him, it was the expression on his face that really drew my attention. He was scowling at us, his face all twisted up, and then dramatically he made a huge sign of the cross, actually standing on tiptoe as he began it, stretching the forefinger of his right hand as high into the sky as he could. I'd seen priests make the sign before, but never with such a big, exaggerated gesture, filled with so much anger, an anger that seemed directed toward us. I supposed he'd some grievance against the spook, or maybe against the work he did. I knew the trade made most people nervous, but I'd never seen a reaction like that. What was wrong with him? I asked when we had passed him and were safely out of earshot. Priests! snapped the spook, the anger sharp in his voice. They know everything but see nothing. And that one's worse than most. That's my other brother. I'd have liked to know more, but had the sense not to question him further. It seemed to me that there was a lot to learn about the spook in his past, but I had a feeling they were things he'd only tell me when he was good and ready. So I just followed him south, carrying his heavy bag and thinking about what my ma'am had written in the letter. She was never one to boast or make wild statements. Ma'am only said what had to be said, so she'd meant every single word. Usually she just got on with things and did what was necessary. The spook had told me there was nothing much could be done about ghasts, 
but Mam had once silenced the ghasts on Hangman's Hill. Being a seventh son of a seventh son was nothing that special in this line of work. You needed that just to be taken on as the spook's apprentice. But I knew there was something else that made me different. I was my Mam's son, too. This ends Disc 1.